a very broad experience in scalability, scalability in general. For the last several years, he's been working on the problem of real-time metrics, and uh, he built a very nice time series database. So they will be sharing some of the some of the wisdom that he earned throughout those years. Hello, everybody. Um, strategically, have not used the restroom, so that I'm excited and will go very fast. Um, have a lot of content. Uh, so I'm going to kind of the, the talk is uh, split into like four sections. Uh, the first one is framing the problem. Uh, the second one gives a very high level overview of the solution that we have. And I'm going to zip through that uh, kind of recklessly because that's not really what the talk is about. Um, and then the third part of the talk is, is really about the nitty gritty uh, software engineering design of the product on a single node. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, the availability of the various bits of software that we use. So I'm Theo Schlossnagel. Um, you may have seen me before with a different configuration of facial hair. Um, I'm Postweight on Twitter, uh, and I, uh, fa I'm the founder and CEO of Circonus. So what's the problem space? Um, so we have a lot of data. Uh, specifically, we have time series data. Uh, we build a monitoring product, and um, we store measurement data on different streams that are coming in. So. Uh, you might uh, be monitoring something like um, uh, the number of CPU ticks that are spent in system idle. And you monitor that every second, you get that number back, uh, you get second by second or sub-second uh, values for that. You might be measuring the latency of every request against a Rita server or the latency of every disk IOP against a spindle. And you're measuring all of those and they're just feeding into you over time. So uh, in the systems that we build, People want to retain that data for a significant period of time. Sometimes it's more, more than 10 years. Um, they need the system to always be available because the one time, it, your monitoring system actually always has to be more available than the system it's monitoring. It's kind of like the rule of thumb. So when your system breaks, the one system that can't be broken at the same time is the one providing you diagnostic information for that, right? So it's kind of a, kind of a shitty job to have. Um, and then we see people that, that really want to store in excess of 10 to the 7th or 10 million different streams of data that are coming in. The frequency range for that uh, is pretty highly variant. Um, so you have things down in the, in the uh, millihertz range, which is um, stuff like, um, I'm going to check how full my disk is. Well, maybe I'll check that every five minutes because it doesn't change that often. And then you have other stuff that's in up to the gigahertz range. So for example, let's measure the number of cycles for every mutex that happens on this box. And I want to I want to track every single mutex lock unlock and I want to know the cycle counts for each one, right? So there's that. Um, and then you've got everything in between. So when you start looking at typical web properties, which are most of our customers, you've got API requests per second, right? Somebody's doing 10,000 web requests per second, they want the latency of each one of those. Um, so that's the type of data we're pulling in. And people are impatient, as we learned in the keynote. So you want very immediate access to all of that data. So you want it coming in in real time, you want it analyzed in real time, and you want it displayed in real time. And when I say real time, I'm clearly talking about soft real time systems here, not hard real time systems. Um, but we're, we're talking about, we have a goal of less than, or around one millisecond for retrieval of, of swaths of data. Um, and, the really interesting part is that dumping data into a database and getting it back out again actually is really boring. Um, you actually want to get answers back out and not data. Um, this whole revolution around data science has people pulling data out of databases and crunching them in tools, um, forgetting that like pulling a terabyte of data out of a database actually costs a lot, right? I mean, it's network. Uh, there's, there's the time of movement. Um, so you really want to collocate uh, computation near the data as, as often as you can. So talking about what we're scribing to disk, uh, just to give you some context on the scope of this, if you're looking at something that's uh, 0.16 hertz, uh, that is once every 60 seconds. Um, so if I'm taking one data point every 60 seconds, that's half a million data points per year on a single stream. If I do 10 million streams at that, you're talking about uh, 5.25 trillion data points per year. So I have 5.25 trillion measurements that come into the system. So now when you bump that up to say just a, just a kilohertz, like a thousand per second, right? Not talking about 100 kilohertz or megahertz or anything like that. Um, and you start talking about 10 million, that's a 10 to the 18th on that, all right? That's a, that's a legitimately large number of measurements that are coming into a system to manage. 
So there are all sorts of techniques that we have to apply. Um, and because we have actually really small users that generate really high volumes of data, so the idea of having a rack of equipment that generates 10 to the 18th data points over the course of 10 years, you don't want 400 racks of equipment to store the data, right? That's really not what you're looking for. So um, a lot of the emerging solutions around time series are really about storing all of the tuples with all of their dimensions and doing all sorts of clever crunching on that after the fact. And we just don't try to solve that problem. We're, we're trying to solve individual, completely denormalized de streams of data that are flowing in, and we want to apply complex math to those. So it's all about cheating and cheating in the right places. So the first thing that we do is we do pretty rudimentary statistics on data that arrives, right? So some number of samples come in, and then what goes out is, hey, I saw this many samples over that time range. Here's the average standard deviation. We do some uh, derivation of that. So we do discrete derivatives. So we can detect rate of change of those signals and the standard deviation of the rate of change. All of that over a time period is 32 bytes. There's a lot of bit packing in there. If, ever, if anybody's ever seen a 15-bit floating point number, that's in there, right? You shave an extra bit off because you need to know something else. So there's a lot of really clever packing that went into that. Um, but what we found was that simply that, that's not enough. Uh, standard deviation t makes a strong assumption that you have normal distribution of data. Um, even if you know your distribution and you have a standard deviation, you can map between them, um, it's still really obtuse. So what we decided to do is treat, uh, to treat histograms as a first class data item. So instead of storing the statistical aggregates, we'll actually store a completely, um, in our case, log linear quantized histogram of data. So you send me 60,000 samples over, over a second, I will compose those into a histogram, I will compress that histogram down, and I'll just store the histogram of that data. So there is data loss, um, but we, there's not sample loss, there's accuracy loss in there. So a lot of measurements come in, we spit out a histogram. And then you get histograms over time that that kind of show you the distribution of, of your latencies over time. And I'll get into some more examples. Uh, but what we're doing here is we're strategically introducing time-based error. So in our database, we store histograms by minute. Um, in the future, we'll probably do by second as well. Um, but we store histograms by minute. So what we're doing is we're introducing up to 30 seconds of time error into, into something to fudge it into, the, into that minute. And then we're introducing value error that's well quantified. It's 2.5% on the upper end by doing log linear quanti quantization of the, the values that are coming in. So 112 becomes um, 100, uh, 110. It goes into the 110 to 120 bucket. So we have some error in there. Um, I'm going to not talk about on disk format because that's really not what this talk is about. There's a lot of work that goes into that. And I'll tell you that we're not where we want to be on that either. Um, but ZFS is magical, so that, that helps. So the scope of the problem is that we're storing all of this data and everybody needs to retrieve it really, really quickly. So how do you store all the data? How do you retrieve it quickly? How do you make sure that if you're actually operating a product based on this technology that it doesn't you know, um, put you out of business, for example, or piss off all your users because it's down all the time? So one of the problems that we have is, is retrieval rates. So we have to retrieve thousands and thousands of swaths of data. So someone will pop up like the, the graph on the left, and they'll set it to a year view. So it's like, OK, well, I've got, in that case, uh, with 24 graphs, something like that, uh, 18 graphs. And, uh, and each one has maybe 50, 60 data points in the, in, the, in the hefty ones. So now you're like, OK, I have 400 data streams that I need to pull over an entire year of time now and draw it on the screen. So there's some pretty interesting retrieval problems there. And lastly, like I said, storing data and retrieving data is kind of old hat. It's not a simple problem, but you really want to be able to apply some complex numerical methods to the math, and you want to make it accessible to data science, data scientists. So recapping, we have this huge petabyte scale problem. We have a zero downtime problem. We have a fast retrieval problem, and we need data locality, uh, math that can apply on, on the data with the data so we don't have to move it around. So that's the problem we have. So what high-level architecture do we use? First thing we did is we tried to use a product so we wouldn't have to build one. Um, but it turns out that when we started this, there really weren't any products out there. Um, and I think that if we had selected things like, um, uh, like InfluxDB, which is pretty, pretty cool, um, and there's another one called um, Prometheus, um, OpenTSDB, all of these might solve the problem. I think it would have led us astray um, because we, I think we, we came up with a really decent solution to what to our very specific problem. 
So the system is simply put, designed like a Dynamo database. Um, Dynamo very specifically has these things called V buckets, where it carves this ring into these virtual buckets, and then servers kind of take responsibility for those buckets, and then you hash a key and you figure out which bucket goes in. So now that I have a key to store in my database, I can find which bucket it's in. So we're very close to that, except that we have two to the 256 buckets. So we don't actually have V buckets, we have buckets. Um, so what happens is we'll have nodes, and here I think I have six nodes by color, and each node will kind of create virtual copies of itself so that it can occupy lots of places on the ring. So if I'm node one, I'll have node one, one, and node one, two, and node one, three. Uh, in production, we'll have those things up to like 90 or 100 of those. And I will hash my node as a key name, and it's going to land somewhere on the ring. So if you look at the, the purple nodes there, there's, there's well, you can see them. There's purple nodes all around the ring. That's the same node in all of its little locations around the ring. So what happens is when you have a key, in this case 01, that key hashes onto the ring as well. We start walking clockwise, and the first nodes that we find that are different are the ones that store the keys. So this is basically consistent hashing. This is exactly what consistent hashing is. So we use this technique. So if we have an n value of a w value of 3, a key comes in, we find the first three nodes clockwise that are unique, and we store the data there. It's pretty simple. Um, the upside of consistent hashing, uh, which I'm not going to dive into deeply, is that if you add a node or remove a node, you have a very um, uh, well-defined behavior for redistribution of keys. So you have a low number of keys that get redistributed across the new topology. So one clever thing that we did, and this is why cleverness is not always a good thing, um, is we thought, you know, what would be really cool is if we have half our nodes in one rack and half our nodes in another rack, it would be really great if one of the racks failed that we could guarantee that all the data wasn't in one rack. So what if we took the ring and cut it in half, and instead of using 2 to the 256 bits, we reserve one bit on the top to see which side of the ring we're on. Obviously, we need to hash slightly differently, so we'll move the nodes around so that half the nodes are on one side and half the nodes on the other side. And those suddenly become availability zones. And now when you walk, you do a little hopscotch algorithm. So you find your first node, and then you go 180 degrees across the ring. And then you go find the next node, and you go 180 degrees across the ring. Still deterministic, still obeys all the properties of consistent hashing. You get nice key redistribution. Um, you select your nodes, you're done. Uh, we have that built into the product. We don't use it anywhere. No client uses it. It's undocumented because it turns out from an operational standpoint, when you're upgrading software, it's really nice to have two rings. And if you have two rings, you just put them in two availability zones. <laughs> so it's way easier to do this. Um, so we actually deploy it this way, uh, and we're very happy. Um, we actually do continuous deployment to some of this stuff. So when someone makes a commit and it automatically checks out, builds, passes a test suite, packages, and auto upgrades a cluster, like it just goes. Um, we do that some places, we don't do that at all places. Um, and this is what an actual interface looks like. Um, so there's six nodes here, and this is kind of a description of where they sit on the ring. It's not as pretty as little dots because there's lots of them in there. It's a highly dense ring. Um, D3 is a pretty cool illustration toolkit. Um, so that's the high-level topology. That, that, that's the high-level architecture. That's sort of the way the product works. You deploy 100 nodes. They have 100 terabytes of, on, on each node. You throw data at the system. It's going to land on three of the nodes. And you, when you recall it, you can find it again. Everything's great. Software has to run on those systems. So I'm going to talk about, and this is what the, the, the core of this is about, is really how we built the software and the problems we ran into. So the first architecture that we came up with this is we have a long history in the companies that, that I've worked in um, of building event-driven software. So instead of using threads for everything, you have an event loop. It drives all of the I.O., non-blocking I.O. on those things. And then work that you can't do in a non-blocking fashion, like computation or disk access, or anything else that would, would block you, uh, taking locks, calling into libraries, things like that, those get put into thread pools. So you have one thread, and all of your accepts and your reads and writes on the network happen on that thread. And when one of them wants to do a significant amount of work, it'll take that job, and it'll assign it to a pool of threads. One of those threads will grab the job, it will execute the job, it will hand it back, and then you can continue doing your non-blocking activity. It's a pretty straightforward technique. The problem with this in a database is that 
it's really, really, really slow. Um, and it's actually not because of the design of the system. It's, it's a good concept. It's because there's a lot of nuances in databases. Um, and we run all of our systems. Oh, it's a travesty. Such a travesty. I spelled dtrace wrong. It has a capital T. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, so we apply dtrace um, and plockstat and things like that to the process to understand why our operations taking so long. Um, so what it turns out um, is that when we have a job and we're doing all these database operations, we're doing a lot of batch work. So I need to ingest a, a million telemetry points. So it turns out that all the, 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 the kind of the first phase that we went out into production with was this idea of instead of having a job have a queue, the job gets actually split up into micro tasks and all of those get fanned out across all of the, uh, all of the CPUs. So this is a pretty generalized technique. Um, I think pretty much any event driven thread pool based system sort of works like this. Um, but we ran into a whole bunch of uh, problems. So the first problem we had is when we ran performance analysis tools, it turned out that we were actually spending most of our time writing logs, right? So instead of doing database operations or writing to disk, we were writing to disk to tell someone that we were writing to disk, right? Um, and they were blocking the progress of systems. So what we did is we built our log subsystem that has this asynchronous behavior. It's optional. So you, you, you create a log, it acts synchronously until you flip a bit, and then it spins out a thread and uses a non-blocking multi-producer, multi single-consumer FIFO between them. Um, and then that thread, that dedicated thread, drives it, and it kind of has an a, a unlimited backlog, effectively. So if you push way more data into the logger that you can write to disk, then the process pops. It'll run out of memory. Um, and that in our case, is, is the kind of the design. If you actually get to the point where you're trying to write more logs than you can, um, don't do that. Um, and that was, a, that was a general thing. People will say, you know, you really should have a limitation. It's like, you know what I should do? I should crash. That's actually a really good behavior. Um, you are behaving badly. You need to be smacked. Um, so, and then the, mo the logging framework here is actually pluggable. So, of course, we have a POSIX file layer where we open a file and write to it. Um, but we also have uh, support JLogs. So there's a library out there called libjlog, um, which does um, segmented write-ahead journals. So you don't ever really have to worry about rotating log files or, or uh, sizing. So as you have subscribers, once you read past old log segments, they get, they get eliminated. It's kind of like our write-ahead log for a database. Um, and then we also have a pluggable thing. We drive web sockets and all sorts of stuff off of it. We have an in-memory ring buffer for this. Um, and Probably the coolest thing was two two cool things. The in-memory ring buffer has debugger support. So when the process crashes, we have debugger helpers that actually know all about the in-memory log buffer, and we can see all of the logs. And it's because it's synchronous, we actually have all the logs up to the point of the crash, um, and it's in memory, so it's not slow, right? I mean, it's it's not slow. Um, the other thing that we have, um, like any log system. People tend to put in logs and take them out based on whether they're debugging or not, and it becomes overwhelming. We have dtrace instrumentation around the logging statements, so you can effectively turn off all of the logging in production, and when you're interested in investigating a problem, your dtrace probes will actually enable the certain logs that you're looking at um, in two different ways. One, you can dtrace them, and it'll actually come back through the dtrace interface or you can dtrace enable them and they'll start logging to a file. So because of the way they work, it's, it's a kind of a clever implementation and it's been a lifesaver for us. Um, it's, I just wish Java logging worked this way, um, that you could go, because normal Java logging is like a terabyte a minute, you know, like if you really turn it on for, for a big app. Um, and usually you have a very specific question you wanna ask. So our logging system, basically, we just plucked it out. So we have a logging system. It's got FIFOs on it. People, when they write a log line and it's asynchronous, it just pops it onto the end of the FIFO, and, and you're set. So the next problem was that we found that our subtasks, all these jobs that we're putting on these thread pools, they had incredibly different workload characteristics. And the reason is, as I mentioned before, we're storing this numeric statistical aggregates, and we're storing these histograms. It turns out that those are in different database backends internally. They have different file system layouts, different file system structures. Some people even put those on different disk pools. So they have very different performance characteristics. So it was really an easy next step to say, 
you know what we should do is we should have separate thread pools based on the workloads that we're doing. So this is as easy as a programmer saying, hey, I need a thread pool that's you know 25 threads and it's gonna be doing histogram writes. And I have another one that's gonna be doing numeric statistical writes. And I have another one that's gonna be doing math. And I have another one that's gonna do this. And then when the jobs come in, they get classified and put onto the right thread pool. So, um, then we, we, we ran into an actual, a very interesting and very specific problem to our architecture. So I think we're still in complete general purpose land here. Um, but what we found was that we, in some of our data stores, we have incredibly high memory activity on a specific key or a set of keys. And when we're across different threads, we end up having really bad cache locality on those different threads where someone tries to update. If I get a million samples a second on, on one key, I actually want to process them all on the same thread. I do not want them bouncing back and forth on different threads. So we didn't really see a general purpose solution to this. So we kind of hybridized the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, job queue thread pooling system. And what we built for, the, for this specific backend was a kind of a statically hashed set of thread pools. So instead of having you know, 128 threads that do writes to this database, we have groups of, we have 32 groups of threads. And then we, we hash all of the keys onto those threads so that we guarantee that we do have distribution across different thread pools, but the same key will always hit the same thread pool. And it, and it reduces lock contention and, and it improves cache locality of all that stuff. So that was something that was really specific. Um, it was an interesting problem to find Again, Dtrace really helped us out there um, in understanding all of that. Cross calls were high. So back to more problems. Um, we have a distributed system. And it turns out, and it's, it's, it's amazing how you're so focused on writing data to a database that you forget about all of the incidental things that actually happen in that process. So not only do we have to write the da data to our database, we actually have to determine what other nodes are slaves to that data, right? So where, where in a cluster I have three copies of the data, I'm responsible for one, I actually need to tell the other two about it if it's, if it's a W value of three. So I actually have to write journals out to those. And we were doing that until very recently. We were just having that kind of morphed into the, to the IO operations of the database. And we found that there was horrible contention because all of these threads that we had, you know, meticulously spread out into different pools um, we're all contending for the same journals to these different peer nodes. So um, again, we actually just leveraged the same system that we had already built and had worker pools for the journals. So now we have worker pools that do, do writes out to the, to the journals. We have worker pools that do each different payload. Um, and they all sort of converge on each other. It's like a matrix organization. So they fan out and then they fan back into the journals. So I might write histogram data and it's in this pool and I might write statistics information in this pool um, and each of those will actually, you know, some percentage of, of each of those jobs will actually end up be going to node eight. So they actually funnel back into a job queue to node eight for doing all of the journaling. So the job queues are actually really simple, um, but one of the problems that, that, that job queuing systems have in general is that um, if you're in an evented system, you really need to do everything in your event loop. You need to act from that thread. And once you've handed a job to a job queue, how do they return and continue on, on that thread? So the job queues are actually really simple. Um, each job queue has a FIFO. Um, and you put the job in the, in the FIFO, right? You put the, put the job in the FIFO. Some thread picks that job up. So it's easier to describe the right side first. So we have um, thread Y, job queue, W1, right? So it's just an infinite loop that waits on a semaphore, picks up a job. Um, it does the asynchronous portion of that job. So every job has like two phases to it, which is really, really useful in the system. So it does the asynchronous portion of that job and it puts it in a return queue to the event scheduler from which it came. And then it wakes up that event scheduler. On Linux it uses event FD, on, on FreeBSD and, and Solaris it uses the, uh, the KQ send and port send and things like that. So it'll pop it in the queue and, and wake up the scheduler. On the scheduler side, when it wakes up because it has stuff to do, it drains that back queue and completes the synchronous portion of that. 
So that, that, that second phase, that async cleanup, is actually in the thread that is the event scheduler. So you can do all of those, all of the things that you're doing that maybe have no locks around them, all the lockless data structures, they can remain lockless because all of the operations can actually happen in the same thread. So we have a lot of parts of our system, like these jobs, they're completely lock free because we guarantee that they only ever act in one thread at a time. So um, the, the implementation actually, it's, it's about five or six years old now. Uh, and some of the nice aspects of it is that it has some, some nice statistical tracking in it. So it'll track how many jobs have gone through, what the, it'll do a smooth average of the wait time and the, and the time executing. It um, automatically knows the origin thread of jobs, so it'll return it to the same scheduler thread um, that, that, that produced it. The concurrency is mutable, so if you have a thread pool that's 10 threads, you can go in and just poke 14 and four more threads will get created. And if you poke eight in it, six threads will shut down as soon as they finish the next job. So those things are, are really, really useful as well. Um, BFM is black fucking magic. There's job abortion code in there that no one should ever use without truly understanding it that does sit uh, the long jump and set jump out of things. So if you're like calling an Oracle client library call and it's blocked all signals, for example, and you need to recover from it being hung forever, um, there's some techniques that you can use in there. We do not use this in our product because it's black magic and, and uh, the only reason you should use it is to recover enough to crash controllably. Um, and then all the event wake up stuff for low latency is uh, we use operating system natives. <clears throat> so, uh, coming kind of coming back to the the last talk with all these atomic operations and 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 non-blocking data structures, when we have these jobs that come in that have you know 40 little subtasks on them, the the mechanism for this is really simple, um, but it ends up being a little crufty in the implementation that we have, which is unfortunate. We just haven't designed an elegant way to do this yet. Um, when I start creating a batch, like I'll I decide. I have a new request come in. I don't know quite yet how many sub jobs I'm going to have. I create a container of this. I set the ref count to one, and I start pumping sub jobs into there and keep incrementing a ref count. And then when I'm finished and I've done the job, I schedule it and I decrement the ref count. So the problem is, is that when I decrement the ref count, it could already be done. And when every single job anywhere decrements the ref count, they could be the one finishing it. So you need to be very careful that everywhere you decrement the red count, you have the callback logic to actually tell someone you're done. Because otherwise the job will be finished and everybody's like, the memory will leak and you won't have an answer to the client or things like that. So that one's a little crufty. Um, probably the, the, the blemish there. But the, the slick part of building all of this on a telemetry store is that you actually get to see the latencies of all the stuff that you build immediately. Um, so this is uh, like a time series histogram of the latencies for the puts. Um, so we can see those four, di we have four different job queues. Uh, we have one that stores um, like change log text data, one that stores numerical statistics, another that stores histograms, and then uh, the, the last one there, the yellow one, is actually the journals to the other nodes. So we can actually see the, the latency in microseconds of each of the, the, the micro tasks. And we track all of those over all of time, and we store them in the database, and everything's great. You can do some really interesting things that you can't see. You can see things that you can't see in systems today. Um, so what do we use this for? This graph is only two days of data. Um, and what we're looking at here is quite clearly, even if you can't read the graph, is something changed. Right? <laughs> something doesn't look right. Um, there was a workload characteristic change here. Um, the interesting part is that this slice where that little gray line is, which is that histogram right there, all that histogram data is, is displayed in that vertical slice based on color density. Um, that's 2.2 2 million samples in just that slice. Um, and this graph itself has 300 million samples in it that are all put into, into that, to that uh, visualization. Um, and the beauty of that is that because of the way we store all this in, in kind of columnar histograms, the retrieval of that is actually super, super simple. You just open a cursor and spit out all the histograms. Um, that's, that's great. So 
This is actually, for trivia, this is what happens when you scrub your devices. So ZFS, we use ZFS under the hood. ZFS scrub can go look at all the disk block and make sure that, um, anybody use a file system that checksums their data? Anybody? There's not enough hands, by the way. Yeah, so everyone should go do that. It's amazing that people don't do that. Um, another amazing thing is that they do that and think that that makes them safe because you only notice when it's broken when you go read it and no one ever reads their data. So then like six years later, you go read the data and it's been broken forever and you don't know. So the idea of scrubbing your data, which is going to read all the blocks and verifying the checksum, is just like a critical part of data safety and people don't accommodate for that IO workload when they provision systems and when they design systems. So now you're in production, you start scrubbing your data and your database engineers are like, don't do that. It's like, I think we're not talking the same way. Right? You have to do that because you can't trust your data otherwise. Um, so you, you really need to understand that. So that's why we build these tools, just so that people can understand that. So the retrieval of the data seems really easy. Um, but kind of the problem of that is that um, data movement is really, really expensive. Um, so if you can imagine an analogy, it's like packing a truck of items and driving it to another state so that someone climbs on the truck and counts them all, and then you drive it back. Um, with a number, right? You could have just counted the damn boxes without shipping them to another state in a truck. Um, so you, you, when you can and you have cheap computation, you want to move the computation to the data. The first rule of having data scientists work on a database is that they should not code in C. Um, so we had in the beginning, we had interesting stuff where they would code in C and then try to link in their Fortran libraries and everything was great and everything crashed all the time. Um, but what we wanted is that we wanted it to be fast. Uh, and what we found uh, after a whole bunch of research was that Lua had an absolutely brilliant prog programming interface for embedding it and uh, it was fast. It was actually it was fast enough. Um, we ran into three problems with embedding LuaJet in our system. Um, one is that LuaJet hates threads. Lua hates threads, just hates threads. So you can't have a Lua interpreter that executes on multiple threads at the same time. Um, <coughs> it's a garbage collection system and you're in a low latency soft real-time system. So garbage collection and soft real-time <coughs> truly hate each other as well. And Lua in general's math support is pretty bad. So how do we solve the thread problem? Uh, kind of just cheated in this, this is really easy, is that we created isolated Lua environments in each thread. So each thread in the system spins up a Lua state, it's self-contained, you can't, if you set a global variable in one thread, if you come back to the same thread it'll be set, if you come back to another thread it won't be set, so there's some programming, um, there's some leakiness to that abstraction, right? So it actually requires developers to not use global variables and not expect those things. And the awful part is that when they do, it sometimes works, right? Um, so, so that's kind of nasty. Um, but it turns out that sharing state between Lua processes via C, while Lua and C get along like peanut butter and jelly, it's so much work to actually call through those conventions all the time. Um, so it's really burdensome for, for the way you program things. And when you put an abstraction in place, people forget it costs anything and then engineers use it in a hot path and you're screwed. So we just tell people to not do that. Um, garbage collection woes, that's a picture of a garbage truck on a car. Um, this is like my experience with Java always. Um, so we actually have a pretty elegant solution for this in this system, a much more complicated one in the other system that we have LuaJIP embedded in, um, where because these consumers, these thread pools, they will, they're waiting for this job queue. So when there's an element on the job queue, all these threads are competing, one of them will grab the job, take its Lewis state, run the whole thing, spit its answer back, and then that thread could go back to consuming, but it doesn't. It goes and garbage collects, and occasionally actually just deletes its Lewis state and creates a new one. And then it goes back into waiting. So basically we are, um, we, we, we call it tail collection. So you're tail collecting all these different states outside of the critical path of job execution. Um, so that works really, really well for us. It doesn't solve the fact that we are garbage collecting. Um, and math. So the interesting part of this, uh, and there's an anecdote that's a little too long to tell, but we embedded 
um, FFT libraries and BLAST and LAPAC and um, CDF libraries, some Fortran CDF libraries into the system so that mathematicians would have really sound, strong mathematical methods that are all written 30 years ago in Fortran mostly, that they, they work the way they expect them. They're the same libraries that R uses, the same libraries that Julia uses, some of the same li libraries that um, products like uh, Mathematica use. Um, and they work, and the CDF ones are actually really important. But what we found out was that BLAST is a basic linear algebra system. So, you know, we have, say, a thousand telemetry streams coming in, and, and we take, you know, six hours of data for each one of them, and we put them in a huge matrix, and we decompose it, and then we find correlation vectors across it. So I can tell, you know, these two are related and these two aren't related, you know, which ones are outliers. One of our mathematicians couldn't get the BLAST stuff to work on their laptop, so they coded it in LuaJIT, and it was faster. So that tells you how epically cool LuaJIT's JIT is. I mean, it's an incredibly advanced JIT. So they were able to code in pure Lua, the uh, you know, uh, the 1,000 by 20,000 matrix decomposition in pure Lua, functional programming language looks a little bit like JavaScript, and it was faster than hand-coded Fortran, um, which is mind-blowing. Uh, big problem is that memory management is still an issue. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a untyped interpreted language, so it's kind of a pain. So but we're happy with the solution. Um, and then what we have is we have this overall architecture, which is actually built up of repeatable building blocks here. So we have the event loop. And one of the interesting parts that took about a year of development is that originally our event loop was only one thread. And we spent a lot of time making sure that we could spin up multiple event loops. So if you have a 32 core box, you can run you know, 64, event loops, two on each core, so that they all can consume simultaneously. And it allows much higher scalability of that. So we have people that manage over two million open sockets in the eventing system, and it just it flies along. Um, that works really, really well. The job queuing system is pretty generic. The logging system is generic. And we turned out that we had all these other generic components that everybody would actually steal object files from this, this project. It would st which is horrible, you steal object files. So they would steal object files, they would build this project and then start linking object files just to get the facilities out of it. Um, and what we did two weeks ago is that we broke this out formally into libmtev and put it on GitHub. Um, so MTEV is basically all of the underlying facilities, all, and they've been in, it started in 1997, all this stuff's been in production for four or five years. Um, and it provides a whole bunch of building blocks for building uh, high performance applications in C that are operable because we're an operations focused organization. So we've got your event loop and your dynamic job queues and stuff like that. Um, we have a really strong module loading framework, so automatic DSO module loading, uh, hooks so you can declare hook points and uh, instrument them from somewhere else. You can actually declare hook points in modules and instrument them from other modules and all sorts of stuff. So it's really flexible. The logging system, the config management system is really interesting in that it's mutable online. So you can modify your config and it knows how to write it out and read it in. Um, and it's all in a database that's just XML. So if you hate XML, screw you. Um, but it works really, really well. Um, and probably the coolest thing is that it has built-in support for an online console. So with one line of config and a couple lines of C, you can boot up a, a console that's self-instrumented. You can go look at all of the file descriptors in the system. You can go look at all the job queues. You can look at their latencies. And then you can programmatically instrument that console. And it feels like, because we're operations junkies, it feels like a Cisco iOS console. You tell that onto it, and you start typing, has tab completion, all sorts of stuff. And all that's driven through the event loop. So anytime you build something into the system, you can provide console drivers for it that expose all of that data through an operations console. So you can make it mutable, you can update things, all sorts of stuff. So that framework is really, really open. Uh, and then we have an HTTP driver, because if you don't serve things over HTTP, you're a loser, apparently. So we, uh, we have all that. So all of those things are in that, that system. Um, the documentation is somewhat lacking on it, because it came out two weeks ago. Uh, and when you don't think you're going to release something, documentation is very different. Um, there's some example apps, but there, 
there's a product called Reconnoiter, which is a monitoring product that is a consumer of this and uses every frickin' feature. So uh, from a proof point by example, you can look at the library and then you can look at, at Reconnoiter, which is next to it in GitHub. It's also open source. Um, and you can see all of the implementations of how everything is done. Um, and then we have Luigit integration. Hasn't made it into the library yet, but it's, 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 it's going there. So all the stuff that we use to build what I just talked about, all of that is open source now um, and consumable as opposed to open source and unconsumable. So that's, that's it. We're hiring. Not very well. Um, and there's a whole bunch of links. And I don't know if everybody caught it on the first slide. Very important URL. On the bottom, that's to the slide stack. So then it has the last slide with all of the links and everything like that.